What if I told you that most dinosaur bones that you see in museums aren't even real? Most of them are made by casting and molding, but the thing is, when they don't have something to make a mold with, they literally just make a bone appear out of thin air, and they call it reconstruction, but the fact of the matter is they made that missing bone using nothing but pure imagination to basically create this creature that may or may not have ever even looked like that. It's my theory, and the theory of many others, that perhaps some of these dinosaurs were made to actually cover up the fact that these bones belonged to a completely different type of creature. Some creature maybe like a dragon or a giant. But why would these great museums, especially the Smithsonian, force the existence of one creature that was never real in the first place to hide the existence of a creature that may have actually existed. What is actually in those excavation sites they say are filled with dinosaur bones? I'm your ghost, John. This is the 21 CD Podcast. Let's get into it. Hey guys, welcome to the 21 CD Podcast. If this is your first time here, hi, I'm John. This is the 21 CD Podcast. Um, I'd like to beg, I I beseech of all of ye to go and follow the Instagram, 21 CD Podcast. That's where most of the updates are going to occur. That's where you're going to see all of the new stuff that's happening um, before it happens. I am about to move from Tennessee to the Great North, where I'm originally from, and there's going to be a lot of cool updates. You're going to hear about them first on the Instagram, 21CD Podcast. For all of those listening on a podcast somewhere, uh, Spotify, Apple, any of the other ones, please remember that I am on YouTube in 4K. And no, it is not just a thumbnail with the same exact audio behind it. You actually get to see me form words and uh, struggle to get my points across. And a lot of people like to do that, believe it or not. So head on over to the YouTube and give me a follow. That's It's, it's really helpful for me to beat the algorithm. Um, it's really helpful to help me beat the algorithm too. So definitely head on over to the YouTube if you guys can. That is my my favorite place to be although i love all of you but i'm also on rumble um i guess because i tried to make an episode that got banned um and taken down from youtube and youtube gave me a a little spanking um so i am on rumble at 21 cd as well um basically if you just google 21 cd podcast you'll find me everywhere just follow me everywhere give me a like follow share subscribe all that stuff helps me beat the algorithm and ultimately find new people to um spread this information to and that's what we're all about trying to spread truth here right trying to at a minimum trying to make people think right there's just a lot of people not thinking these days there's a lot of people just accepting the absolutely BS narrative that has been given to us. I don't cuss on the 21 CD podcast. That's the closest I've been yet, but it it is that way. It's BS. It's just this narrative that we have just stuck with, you know, and despite the fact that there's piles, monumental piles of evidence to the contrary, um, when it comes to many of the aspects of this narrative, We just don't care. In the United States, you know, I've been all over the world, but in the United States specifically, we just keep forcing this story that doesn't make any sense about the origins of man, the origins of the country, who was here first, all of that stuff. So much of it is fraudulent and fake and just 
doesn't make sense. And for some reason, though, in all the schools, we still just be accepting these lies. And our children are learning them, and we're tearing down statues, and all of this stuff that doesn't go with the narrative that the elites and the people above want us to follow doesn't make sense to me so we're going to talk a little bit about the narrative today you guys wanted a conspiracy episode that's what you voted for on the instagram and so here we are we're talking about this beast known as the smithsonian and why the heck they would want to hide giants okay that's what this episode is about. Why is the Smithsonian hiding giants? What are they doing with the giant bones? Why are they doing that thing with the giant bones? And what are they replacing the giant bones with? Because clearly something is coming out of the ground. So, uh, spoiler alert, it's dinosaurs. So here we go, guys. Dinosaurs, the Smithsonian, and giants. According to the American Museum of Natural History, the first scientific account about a dinosaur fossil was not published until 1677 in Europe. Okay. Then Englishman Robert Plot described the lower end of a thigh bone that formed the knee of Megalosaurus, a carnivorous dinosaur common in Jurassic rocks, which walked on two hind legs. Sounds kind of like a T-Rex. At the time, however, Plot did not recognize his find as the bone of some long-dead reptile. Nay. What's interesting about this find is uh, not that it was the first dinosaur fossil really talked about in a big way, but rather the fact that Plot actually assumed that he had found a piece of a giant human a human. Why would he assume that if he didn't actually think that what he found looked like a human? Right? Like, this is an educated guy. But along came this dude in the early 1800s known as William Buckland. And he is from the mystical land known as Oxford University. Okay? He was the first professor of geology at Oxford. And uh, he said, well... That bone that Plop found is not a giant human, okay? This is something, uh, this is a giant lizard. Let's, let's get the facts straight. He didn't say it was a dinosaur, because the word dinosaur wasn't even invented yet. But he did say this is not a human. This is a giant lizard. The thing about William Buckland is that he's from this fantasy land known as Oxford. And in Oxford, uh... They published papers on conspiracy theorists saying that conspiracy theories are nothing more than um, methods used to cope with a reality that conspiracy theorists cannot accept, often stemming from issues in their personal lives. And they've even gone so far to say that conspiracy theories are for losers. So automatically, I'm kind of like, okay, Oxford... I don't know if I'm going to believe everything that you're saying because apparently if I don't believe the narrative, I'm a loser, right? But along came the 1820s, fossils of Megalosaurus and Iguanodon, and you guys will probably know Iguanodon because uh, there was that movie by DreamWorks called, I think it was just called Dinosaur, and the main characters were Iguanodons. Um, they're herbivore dinosaurs, and they were discovered by geologists and doctors in England and recognized to belong to Two giant extinct reptiles. Their pieces were found. They seemed like giant reptiles. That's fine, because we're not saying that dinosaurs didn't exist. We're saying that not all of these bones were these mystical, magical dinosaurs that you guys are talking about. A couple of decades later, in 1841, the famous English anatomist Sir Richard Owen coined the name Dinosauria, meaning terrible lizard, to refer to this group of what he considered to be enormous extinct lizard-like reptiles, because it is more realistic to believe in enormous extinct lizard-like reptiles than it is to believe in enormous extinct human-like humans, okay? 
That's the general way of thinking coming out of these early narrative crafters, because this is kind of the origin story for the narrative. This is where the narrative kind of starts to begin. And it, it isn't exactly where it begins, because you have all the Mystery Babylon cults, the Knights Templar, Order of Assassins, Freemasons, all of those that are already crafting this sort of narrative. But this is really where museums start to say, you know what, we can't accept the fact that giant humans were being made, because the forces of evil, how this is... This is my personal belief, but the forces of evil are already working to eliminate something from the real true story of humanity, of our existence, of our story, the way that it was. The narrative, as we know, guides us on a path, a crafted path, so that we cannot divert from it. And if we do, we are considered conspiracy theorists. And this is where it starts when it comes to giants. It's the origin of this convenient story, um, dinosaurs. And how dinosaurs have replaced giants. But of course, I don't know everything. I don't know that dinosaurs never existed. I believe that some did exist. I believe that there were some gigantic lizards walking around. But I also know that over the years, many educated people have come out and said that mm, not all of these dinosaurs are actually real. You guys invented a lot of them. And furthermore, um, humans lived among them if they did exist. So this idea that the Earth was just overrun with gigantic lizards is kind of nonsense. And some of these bones, well, they're not indicative of the creature's that you say they represent. As a matter of fact, when dinosaur bones were being discovered in droves, it was kind of like the gold rush. Like, there, it was a huge market, believe it or not. The dinosaur bone market was a massive rush. The Smithsonian and other museums would actually literally pay anybody and everybody for good dinosaur bone specimens. And they'd allegedly pay more for full skeletons, which means that these archeology span types and anybody with a shovel were sort of incentivized to create dinosaurs, whether they had full skeletons or not. Evidence has been found that the Brontosaurus and the Diplodocus, for example, didn't even look like those dinosaurs as we know them. And yet the museums just to this day keep going with it. They keep manufacturing these dinosaurs. They keep making them look the way that we now know they didn't look. I'll, keep, I'll say it louder for the people in back. They keep faking it. Even though we know they didn't look like that. Why? China is actually the world's lar largest manufacturer of dinosaur bones, which is funny. To this day, dinosaur bones that we've been led to believe were real are actually being found to be fake, literally not even made of bone in some instance. And whether this is due to a misunderstanding or that the bones were actually just lies, like literally like they're telling us lies so that we don't know the truth, is up in the air. It's, it's anybody's guess, but if you're like me... You're a loser conspiracy theorist, and uh, you kind of believe that, well, maybe these bones were actually made to divert us from the truth. There's an incredibly deep dive that was done by Nautilus, and it says that dinosaurs cannot be experimented on. Instead, scientists have to interpret the fossil record, which is, as we know, spotty at best. The first dinosaur discoveries consisted of only a few bones and a handful of teeth. Before long, more complete skeletons began to be found, but the individual pieces were usually scattered about in a jumbled mess of material. It's not like Jurassic Park, where you just happen upon this perfect skeleton of dinosaur of dinosaurs just laid out all dramatically and beautifully. No, these bones, like, you gotta understand, these people believe that these bones were dropped here millions and millions and millions and millions of years ago. Why are they trying to convince us that they're just laid out nicely the way that they fell all those millions of years ago, and we can just pick them up and walk over to a museum and drop them in there and boom, dinosaurs! No, that's not the way it works. 
They're scattered all over the place, and we don't know which bones go where, and we don't know if they're all from the same dinosaur, or if some of these are cow bones, or if some of these are elephant bones, or if some of these are <clears throat> giant bones. We have no idea. And often they've also been crushed and distorted by the immense pressures at work during and after the process of fossilization, which in most cases is literally them being turned to stone. For that reason, paleontologists um, had to work hard to assemble dinosaurs into something that actually resembled real live animals. In doing so, they relied not only on the available evidence, but also their own judgment and imagination. In a way, these people were kind of artists. They were creating something that may or may not have even looked like the thing that they're creating. Because dinosaurs are in part creatures of the imagination, they reveal a great deal about the time and place in which they were found, studied, and put on display. Right? Often, paleontologists tasked with reconstructing the fragmentary remains of these animals have been guided in their pursuits by analogies to more familiar objects and circumstances. It's like when somebody needs to look at something to draw a picture. Hey, mom, can you draw me a, a man? Sure, but uh, do you have a picture of a man that I can sort of use as a reference? That's the same concept for building these dinosaur bones, these skeletons that they believe looked the way they looked. They had to make them up because they don't exist. We've never seen them. So we're making it up. It's like a puzzle, except we don't know what the picture is of. In the mid-19th century... Uh, the British anatomist Richard Owen modeled dinosaurs on pachyderms, such as the elephant, whereas the American paleontologists were modeling them after kangaroos. It was not until the turn of the 20th century that dinosaurs came to be seen as these massive, hulking, and lumbering behemoths of prehistory. More recently, many museums have completely overhauled their aging dinosaur displays yet again to better reflect contemporary views of these creatures as bird-like, active, and fast-moving with complex social structures. Because remember, dinosaurs are supposed to be these giant lizards, right? But for some reason, the chicken is the closest relative to dinosaurs. Something doesn't quite make sense there, because chickens aren't reptiles last time I checked. It's kind of weird to keep pushing a false narrative just because you convinced everybody that it was the way you said it was, and then you made a bunch of little kids fall in love with dinosaurs and, you know, made a bunch of movies called Jurassic Park, and now it's just sort of like, oh, this is the way dinosaurs are. We did it, guys. Good job. We convinced everybody. In the old, old days, they used to talk about dragons. As we know... Dragons are one of those creatures that we are supposed to uh, never believe in. Like, we're, these are things of fantasy. These are things of story, of myth. They're only these elements of storytelling. But every culture has stories of dragons. And the dragons from Asian legend and lore paint them in a particularly magical light. They were, they were deities. They were gods. And they transcended time. In the Christian Bible, it talks a little bit about that too, how in the end days, a great dragon is going to come. Some say that a number of dinosaur bones that we have found point to the existence of these dragons, and that's a whole nother episode. We're not going to go down that rabbit hole. But this way of thinking does have two camps, and one is that the dinosaur were invented by ancient people who found their bones, first of all, or two, that ancient people kind of lived among these creatures. Because, like, let's be honest, ancient people are probably finding dinosaur bones and being like, wow, these are dragons. But at the same time, there's petroglyphs and writings and paintings, especially in medieval history, of people fighting dragons and walking among dragons and dinosaurs. These things exist. So unless they are inventing these creatures and painting them and drawing them and carving them into walls, they actually existed. And... Mankind walked among them. I'm kind of in that camp where I believe that some form of dinosaur did exist and walked among mankind. I'm not saying that dinosaurs didn't exist. I do think some gigantic reptiles and maybe gigantic bird-like creatures did exist. We Some of these bones are real, right? 
And we know that there are certainly large reptiles and critters that existed that no longer exist. Things go extinct. These dinosaurs, some of them, were among those creatures that have gone extinct. But a lot of them are completely fabricated, made up. No proof that they ever existed. Because even the very bodies that they've constructed to use as proof are not proof. It's not what they looked like. We have no idea they built those. But what we do have as alleged proof are loads of writings, legends, tales, cave paintings, petroglyphs, religious texts, hieroglyphics, and basically all forms of human transcription that seem to say that humans walked among large lizard-like creatures. I'm just pointing that out so you don't think I'm saying dinosaurs didn't exist. They did. Some kind of dinosaur existed. But that's not really what this episode is about because believe it or not, this episode isn't about dinosaurs. Even though they are definitely suspicious and interesting, this episode is about the Smithsonian and giants and why it seems that maybe the Smithsonian is calling giants dinosaurs in some instances. In 1784, which is basically 20-ish years uh, before William Buckland of Oxford categorized Plot's giant bone as a dinosaur bone, um... Thomas Jefferson received a letter from a man named Ezra Stiles, and Ezra Stiles was the seventh president of Yale, and a scientist who corresponded with both Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin about scientific discoveries. He was discussing some very large teeth and bones that people were identifying as elephant bones throughout Europe and in North America, and specifically Ohio. And he had this to say to Thomas Jefferson. And I forgive me, this, this is Old English, so it's kind of hard to understand, but try to go with it. June 1706. On the 14th, one coon, a Dutchman that came from Albany, brought to my house and shooed me another tooth of the monster, buried at Claverack, as is related in July 1705, like a grinder tooth, with three ridges on its top and as hard as a stone, the fangs much decayed. It was as big as a great fist and weighed two pounds and an ounce, and he brought two pieces of another bone conjectured to be of the wrist. Being about a third part of the bone is split down its length. The perfect bone, looking like dull olivant, was nigh an inch thick and porous inward part great. The bone, if it had had the other two parts joined to it, would, it's judged, have been as big as the calf of a man's leg of the biggest size. So this wrist, essentially, would have been as big as the biggest man's calf. Okay? The Dutchman asserted that they took up a bone, judged to be the knee bone, that was about a foot in its diameter, and the place where the bone lay was 25 paces. Uh, long, according to which the monster was judged to above 60 or 70 feet high. That's how tall this creature would have been. The Indians flocking to see the monstrous bones upbraided the Dutch with unbelief in that they would not believe the report of a monstrous person, which they had told them from their father's viz that about 240 years ago there was a monstrous person as high as the tops of the pine trees that would hunt bears till they took the tree till they shook the trees and then would catch them with their hands and it would go into the river 12 or 14 feet deep and catch three or four or five sturgeons at a time and broil them on the fire for food okay and then he talks about two other dutchmen bringing more teeth the same size and weighing upwards of five pounds and he says to Thomas Jefferson, I saw all this with my own eyes and I weighed them myself. Again, it's kind of hard to understand, but these this guy is talking about these gigantic bones and teeth that he's finding, that he's seeing, that are being brought to him, that he's witnessing. And they're saying that these have to be of elephants. But the Indians are coming forth, the natives of these places, and saying... These are gigantic humans. These are not elephants. Like these are these things would run through the trees, catch bears with their bare hands and eat them. And then they would go 14 or 15 feet into the water and catch fish by the handfuls. 
So fast forward, okay? It's 1846. The Smithsonian has been founded in the United States. In Washington, D.C. By the United States government. The Smithsonian was crafted by the United States government, ladies and gentlemen. Do I need to say more about why maybe you shouldn't trust everything that they say? They say it was created for the increase and in diffusion of knowledge. Diffusion is a very interesting word there. Nowadays, if you look up the Smithsonian conspiracy, their destruction of giant bones literally make up most of the results. And this is kind of what we're talking about today. Did the Smithsonian follow their British predecessors in the path to hide giants and continue to direct the narrative in the New World? Because as we already said, we know that they were already trying to eliminate that story in Old Europe. So with America being extremely closely related to Europe, is it possible that the Smithsonian was manufactured by the United States government and funded by Europeans, essentially, to continue the narrative in the New World. This new rising power must also follow the narrative. The Smithsonian was, after all, named after an extremely wealthy scientist donor named James Smithson. He was a European who left his fortune to the U.S. government for the purpose of building the Smithsonian, literally, despite the fact that he had actually never even been to the United States. Like many politicians and elite figures in our world today, nobody actually knows how Smithson acquired his wealth. It's also curious that he was a graduate of, you guessed it, Oxford, the school that considers conspiracy theories coping, coping mechanisms for losers. Oh, and did I mention that Smithson was also a Freemason? Hmm. For those who haven't heard me talk about the Freemasons before, it's my belief that secret society, um, this secret society in particular, is just one of the hosts of mystery Babylon cults that are literally the reason for the massive amount of deception, lies, and evil in the world today. I have episodes where I talk about the Freemasons and Mystery Babylon cults. These cults, these secret societies, are the reason that everything is so confusing these days. That the narrative doesn't make sense, that nothing seems to line up, that people are, uh, that there's this one world bank system coming, that people are um, subjected to terrible amounts of deception and lies and corruption and engineered pre-programmed paths. All of this is thanks to the secret societies. So what a surprise that a Freemason from Oxford who has never been to America donates his fortune, which was massive, to the United States government for the sole purpose of creating a museum in the New World for the diffusion of knowledge. Very interesting. But that's a rabbit hole for another time. What's interesting, though, is that later Alexander Graham Bell, the guy who invented the telephone and the mine detector, brought Smithson's bones from Europe to the United States for some reason. Oh, and Alexander Graham Bell was also a Freemason. So that's kind of how the Smithsonian came to be, right? But... Just having an organization that directs the narrative isn't really enough because there's still a bunch of people out here who are going to be digging up evidence to the contrary that goes against the narrative. And we see this all the time. A lot of, t a lot of the content in shows like Ancient Aliens is ridiculous, but some of the stuff that they're talking about is actual evidence that goes against the narrative. They're just talking about it in a weird way that might not be the real truth either. And I think that's a whole conspiracy too, which is if anything goes against the narrative, let's make it sound absolutely bizarre so that nobody actually believes it. But the fact of the matter is a lot of the evidence that they bring forth in that show is evidence for something alternative to the narrative that giants never existed, that God never existed, that we all came from some primordial puddle that which also came from nothing, like that dinosaurs roamed the earth even though most dinosaurs that we found are only like teeth 
and we don't actually know what they even look like or what they did or what they ate or what they sounded like or anything like that. That's all the narrative. And if you believe something contrary to that, it's it's usually portrayed in shows like like Ancient Aliens, which make no no sense at all a lot of the time, right? But as I was saying, before I went on that tangent, sorry, I'm I'm a little bit wired tonight on this topic, but people are still out here discovering evidence to the contrary. And they're still writing about these things, and they're still showing other people. And in the old world, in the early days of America, so like the late 1800s, early 1800s, early 1900s, a lot of communication was done through letters and newspapers. And there are hundreds and hundreds of newspaper clippings of giant bone discoveries. It's insane how many there are. So many people in this old-ish world were talking about giant bones in the early 1800s to the early 1900s. And then they just stop. And it's probably because that's when censorship really started coming into effect. A newspaper, the Worthington Advance, from Minnesota in 1897, had a very bizarre article published about an archaeological dig that was called so mysterious and such a blind study that it could be compared to cracking the code of ancient Egypt. The article talks about effigy mounds found mainly in Wisconsin but extending into Iowa. The article goes on to say that there was an obvious long-standing civilization of mound builders in the area and that the entire Prairie du Chien Valley was dotted with proof. One thing about mounds I think that they don't want us to know is that they are usually hollow. There are things inside the mounds. What are those things? According to this article, there was a giant roughly 7 foot 6 inches tall in one of them, and the bones were said to crumble when the air touched them. This makes it kind of hard to prove, but what isn't hard to prove is that in these days, the Smithsonian was literally paying for any artifacts dug out of mounds. People of all types and from every walk of life literally decimated the mounds of North America in order to find anything they could sell to the Smithsonian. Treasures of unimaginable value were found, including items and ores and artifacts that originated nowhere near to the regions the mounds were in. In one mound, 11 skeletons were found in an inner chamber with their backs against the wall, surrounded by precious items, and also in this mound was a giant seashell with some strange copper-colored dust thought later to be ashes, and they created such a noxious, a noxious smell that the dig had to be suspended. The, fu the, the mound filled with fumes, and the workers had to leave the mound. Items from all over the world were found in these mounds. And this is proven by the fact that many of these items had inscriptions, coat of arms, or other identifying features on them that pointed to their location of origin. It's believed a great race actually built the mounds and continued to for some time after Europeans came to North America. But unfortunately, due to the massive amount of digging, the mounds and almost everything in them have been completely whisked away and destroyed by secret societies and the Smithsonian. Why? Why such a push to hide these things? Why are there not more on display in museums? Why are none of these things on display in museums? We're led to believe that these natives were nothing but, you know, dirt farmers. But there's... There's... There's so much evidence that points to the contrary. That points to the this idea, this fact, that there were great civilizations in America. Why did the natives across North America believe in a race of giants and even have stories of great beasts that would hunt bears with their hands and they were so big that the treetops would shake when they ran through the woods? Another thing that this, this whole, like, the Smithsonian caused this rush for artifacts in my opinion, not only to get all of the artifacts as quickly as possible, to get all of the evidence that goes um, 
that points to some other reality apart from the narrative, but also to literally destroy evidence, to literally destroy the history of North America. Because these people were, uh, most of the time, not archaeologists, not scientists, not doctors. These were farmers. These were literally anybody with a shovel who would just go out destroy mounds and a lot of the time destroy bones scatter artifacts all over the place accidentally literally destroy these sites where there was evidence where the story was being told of north america and leave them completely desecrated and unreadable so that it was just there was no way to know what happened here I think that is a huge goal. That was a huge goal of the Smithsonian in these days. The Rathdrum Tribune out of Rathdrum, Idaho, had an article published in 1910 speaking of a giant skeleton estimated to be 10 feet tall found in a cave near a strange and equally massive flintlock rifle. The skull, according to the article, was roughly twice the size of a regular man's, and the rifle near it was said to weigh 25 to 30 pounds. It's a pretty big gun for a pretty big man. The article claimed the bones were being packaged to be sent to the Smithsonian, which is just incredibly convenient. I've got a few more articles, and I'm just picking some. This was this was the hardest part of this episode, was trying to pick ep um, articles for you guys, because there were so many, and even after I had already compiled these articles... I was finding more that I was like, ugh, I wish I would have chosen that one instead, but um, I've already got so much content here that I, I'm not going to rewrite everything. But I encourage you guys to look this stuff up because you can still find it, and who knows how much longer you'll be able to. 200 giant skeletons were said to be found in some mines in Mexico. Some of them were over 9 feet tall. And they were discovered by a Boston man who claimed that he was unable to bring proof back to the States because the Mexican government was very protective of the find. They believed that the giants predated the Aztecs, according to this article, and that they survived off of the plentiful food sources in the area. Alexander Agassiz, a prominent scientist at the time, was said to be informed of the find, and he intended to make a journey to the mines, but it appears that he died before he was able to. Agassiz was a creationist, by the way, and his son Louis is said to have discovered the Megalodon. So, busy family. I wasn't able to find anything that said either of them were Freemasons. So, creationists, not Freemasons, conveniently don't make it to the location of the giants. Weird. In 1923... Near where I currently live, here in Nashville, a woman found a seven-foot-tall skeleton buried on her land. She said that she had found the bones of more than 50 other members of what she was calling this tribe that she believed to be in the area. The Smithsonian, of course, was promptly notified, and there is no more info on this story. The list of articles proclaiming the discovery of giant remains are literally countless from early to pre-modern USA times. Journals from accredited explorers also speak of finding giants. Antonio Pigafetta, a Venetian nobleman, joined the expedition of Magellan as the official chronicler of the voyage. If you guys remember the journeys of Magellan. Pigafetta kept a richly detailed diary of these expeditions in which he made entries every day of the entire odyssey. He said that one of the reasons for joining the expedition was to gain some fame for posterity. Here is an excerpt from his diary. Leaving that place, we finally reached 49 and one half degrees toward the Antarctic Pole. As it was winter, the ships entered a safe port to winter. We passed two months in that place without seeing anyone. One day, we suddenly saw a naked man of giant stature on the shore of the port dancing, singing, and throwing dust on his head. The captain general sent one of our men to the giant so that he might perform the same action as a sign of peace. Having done that, the man led the giant to an islet, into the presence of the captain general. 
When the giant was in the Captain General's and our presence, he marveled greatly and made signs with one finger raised upward, believing that we had come from the sky. He was so tall that we reached only to his waist, and he was very well proportioned. His face was large and painted red all over, while about his eyes he was painted yellow, and he had two hearts painted on the middle of his cheeks. His scanty hair was painted white. He was dressed in the skins of animals skillfully sewn together. That animal has a head and ears as large as that of a mule, a neck and body like those of a camel, the legs of a deer and the tail of a horse, like which it neighs, and the land has very many of them. In his hand he carried a short, heavy bow with a cord somewhat thicker than those of the lute, and made from the intestines of the same animal, and a bundle of rather short cane arrow feathers like ours, and with points of white and black flint stones in the manner of Turkish arrows instead of iron. Those points were fashioned by means of some stone. Okay, a little bit hard to read because again this is ancient text, but you kind of get the point. There's this giant here, and um, he's clad in these skins from these animals that were in this area, and these guys went to see him, and he was apparently kind of peaceful, but what we're talking about here is not his demeanor, but more the fact that he exists, that there is a giant. It is significant to note that the above narrative is taken from the journal of the official chronicler of Magellan's voyage of discovery. That is, the one person above all others who is tasked with recording and keeping the most accurate records of events, activities, etc., whether exotic or mundane. This person is not only responsible to the commander of the voyage, but also to the king and country for his eyewitness accounts as a complete, precise, and accurate testimony of events that occur occurred during the voyage. This guy's not supposed to be making stuff up. Based on his position and responsibilities alone, his first-hand eyewitness testimony of encounters with 10-foot giants must be taken at least somewhat factual. To do otherwise is to trivialize the importance of the, chronolo the chronicler's fundamental accountability. Now look, we know people make stuff up, right? Like, you can't believe everything you read especially nowadays, but, and, and I'm sure that was true back then too, we, we know that people would write in articles, stories just to get attention, because that is one of the things that make us human, we love stories, but these guys who were writing the chronicles of journeys, especially those of Magellan, were not necessarily supposed to be making stuff up in the official journals, the, the recollections of what actually happened. They are recording history. There's not really a place for them to be making stuff up, and they could be punished severely for doing so. The Epic of Gilgamesh from ancient Mesopotamia talks about giants in the Old World. We kind of talked about this a little bit before. And as we know, legend and lore are often laced with historical truth from the old days, because in the old days, they weren't always writing history books. Sometimes they were just writing stories, legends, lores. That's why a lot of these demigods, there's a good chance they were Nephilim or Elohim, right? The Epic of Gilgamesh talks about giants. This was a, a, one of the most famous tales from that time, from that part of the world. It described how Spartans uncovered the body of Orestes, which was seven cubits long, around ten feet tall. In his book, The Comparison of Romulus with Theseus, Plutarch describes how the Athen Athenians uncovered the body of Theseus, which was more than ordinary size. The kneecaps of Ajax were exactly the size of a discus for the boy's pentathlon, wrote Pausanias. A boy's discus was about 12 centimeters in diameter, while a normal adult patella is around 5 centimeters, suggesting Ajax may have been around 14 feet tall. Christians will immediately recognize the famous Genesis 6-4 that says there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. And giants were so familiar in biblical times, as a matter of fact, that there were famous ones who were also known by name. A few of them are mentioned in the Old Testament. Anak, Arba, Anakim, Achiman, Rapha, Sefer, and Og, the king of Bashan, who was killed by the Israelites under Moses during the Battle of Edrei. 
Is this the reason for the Smithsonian's hiding of giant bones and artifacts? Is it all really to change the narrative in a way that doesn't give any hope for a biblical truth? For any sort of spiritual reality whatsoever? I'm trying to find the word here because it's not... It just doesn't make sense. Is this why they've relied so heavily on the existence of dinosaurs? Are dinosaur bones the literal keys for explaining away giants? And why was the Smithsonian so firm about there being no great civilizations in North America before Europeans? Sounds a bit like the Big Bang Theory to me. No. There was nothing, barely anybody, and nothing was really that impressive about North America well, until we got here. Well, there's tons of evidence pointing to the contrary, Smithsonian. It's just all labeled as fringe science and conspiracy theories for losers. The New York Times, even, on a number of occasions wrote about giants. In 1882, a skull of heroic size and singular formation has been discovered among the relics of the mound builders in the Red River Valley. The mound was 60 feet in diameter and 12 feet high, and near the center were found the bones of about a dozen men and women, mixed with the bones of various animals. The skull in question was the only perfect one, and near it were found some abnormally large body bones. The man who bore it was evidently a giant. A thorough investigation of the mound and its contents will be made by the Historical Society. And in 1916, Professor A.B. Skinner of the American Indian Mu Museum, Professor W.K. Moorhead of Phillips Andover Academy, and Dr. George Donahue, a Pennsylvania State historian who have been conducting researches along the valley of the Susquehanna, have uncovered an Indian mound at Tioga Point on the upper portion of Queen Esther's Flats on what is known as the Murray Farm, a short distance from Sarah Penn, which promises rich additions to Indian lore. In the mound uncovered were found bones of 68 men, which are believed to have been buried 700 years ago, the average height of these men was 7 feet, while many were much taller. Further evidence of their gigantic size was found in large celts or axes hewed from stone and buried in the grave. On some of the skulls, two inches above the perfectly formed forehead, were protuberances of bones. Members of the expedition say that this is the first discovery of its kind on record and a valuable contribution to the history of early races. Well, don't tell the Smithsonian that because they will find their way to you. The skull and a few bones found in one grave were sent to the American Indian Museum. There are many who believe that there is solid evidence that has been shared over the years, revealing that the Smithsonian Institution has intentionally discarded many giant skeletons and other artifacts that did not fit into their evolutionary religion. Because make no mistake, their narrative is their religion. And it, it seems to be satanic in a way. But they will take these bones, allegedly, into the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and dump them, and have done so, and seem to continue to do so. If someone were interested in covering up the truth, this is exactly what they would do. They would bring them out to the middle of the ocean and dump them. There's simply too many to hide anywhere else. People close to native tribes, as well as members of said tribes, have stories about the mounds that we've been talking about, saying that the mounds are sacred because they're not only burial grounds for their people, but also for the race of giants that plagued them. And this is why attempting to dig at such sites could send you straight to prison these days, the truth cannot be verified. They can't let you know what's in those mounds. Because now there's too much red tape protecting the mounds, right? But that kind of works in the Smithsonian's favor as well, because as long as they're protected, nobody's going to dig in them. We don't have to dig in them. We don't have to destroy them, as long as nobody else is either. The Spanish explorers also mention in their ship's logs running into tribes of giants in what is now Florida and Texas. These beings were about 8 feet tall and well built. Though good looking, they were said to be quite violent and they had bows with arrows the sizes of spears and if you got too close to one, they'd attack you. Some say they were left over from the uh, Atlantis high-tech civilization that built the pyramids. 
sometimes called the Nephilim or the giants in the Old Testament, and also sometimes called gods, though at a maximum, they were probably the descendants of Elohim, and as some of you guys know, we call those the Nephilim. So with all this written and oral history, and perhaps even actual buried evidence, why is the Smithsonian so hell-bent on hiding the truth of giants? You know, we're kind of running around in circles here at this point, but we have allegedly found tons of artifacts, hieroglyphs, petroglyphs, and even mummies from ancient Egypt in various parts of the southwestern United States. Things that the Smithsonian has also covered up because they go against the narrative. These things have been found in the Grand Canyon. The story goes that G.E. Kincaid, conveniently a Smithsonian explorer in 1909, saw a cave entrance about 2,000 feet above a riverbed in the Grand Canyon and hiked up to explore it. The story goes, When I saw the chisel marks on the wall inside the entrance, I became interested. So I was securing my gun, and I went in. During the trip, I went back several hundred feet along the main passage till I came to the crypt in which I discovered mummies. The tomb, or crypt, in which the mummies were found is one of the largest of the chambers, the walls slanting back at an angle of about 35 degrees. On these are tiers of mummies, each one occupying a separate hewn shelf. At the head of each is a small bench on which is found copper cups and pieces of broken swords. Some of the mummies are covered with clay and are all wrapped in bark fabric. Kincaid said later in the article, It is worth noting that all the mummies examined so far have proved to be male. No children or females are buried here. This leads to the belief that this exterior section was the warrior's barracks. According to the report, the mummies were not alone. He grabbed a number of relics taken from the Indiana Jones archaeological playbook and left, shipping them off to Washington. Going further inside, he discovered a large area with rooms chiseled out of the rock. Over 100 feet from the entrance in the cross hall, 700 feet long, in which are found the idol or image of the people's god sitting cross-legged with a lotus flower or lily in each hand. That's the Buddha. The cast of the face is oriental, Kincaid said. The idol almost resembles Buddha, though the scientists are not certain as to what religious worship it represents, though it has been said that a Buddha has been found in the Grand Canyon, which is just... Even more bizarre. Taking into consideration everything found thus far, it is possible that this worship most resembles the ancient people of Tibet. The report claimed that Kincaid had found a number of other artifacts, including vases, urns, and copper and gold cups, which the Smithsonian was definitely investigating. Weirdest of all these unusual finds were the hieroglyphics. On all of the urns, or walls, over doorways, and tablets of stones, which were found by the image, uh, are the mysterious hieroglyphics, the key to which the Smithsonian Institute hopes yet to discover, because of course they do. They want to discover it and then hide it from everybody. The engraving on the tables probably has something to do with the religion of the people. I think they mean tablets, but we're going off of uh, old writing here. Similar hieroglyphics have been found in southern Arizona among the pictorial writings. Only two animals are found, and one is of prehistoric type, maybe a dinosaur of some sort. As the old saying goes, extraordinary claims require ex extraordinary evidence though, right? And for that reason, this story has often been labeled a hoax. And they say, the Smithsonian says, G.E. Kincaid never existed. We never found anything of the sort in the Grand Canyon. And um, Egyptians have never been to North America. Like, the list goes on. They basically say, this. everything about this story is hogwash. There's no way any of this could have happened. None of this ever happened. And in my opinion, that's precisely what somebody who is hiding something would say about something that did indeed happen. But if you Google this... You will find this story told in different ways, in different places, but you won't ever find anything where the Smithsonian actually says this happened. But people have come forth, and they have said that regardless of whether King Cade is a made-up name or not, maybe it's a false identity to hide the operation altogether that most definitely did exist, there was an operation by the Smithsonian in the Grand Canyon, which was super top secret, and there are still concrete pads at this location, which, by the way, has been closed off to the public. 
It is patrolled by armed guards and helicopters, and those concrete pads are often believed to be where heavy machinery was uh, basically stabilized. Like, think of like a crane or something on these, these concrete pads so that it could lift contents out of the cave, out of the canyon, to the surface above. It is most definitely proven, though, that the Smithsonian had a camp set up or near this location for several weeks. There are eyewitnesses. And yet, the Smithsonian denies this as well. To this day, though, these locations are guarded by armed individuals. And people say it's for our safety, but it could be for something much more, such as protecting the narrative, which essentially governs the passage of time as we know it. It governs the way that the world will turn out, it, govern, it has governed the way that the world has been because the narrative has been so staunchly protected and engineered by the most powerful of people in the world and probably by heavenly beings that are not necessarily on our side. Elohim, Nephilim, Satan himself, fallen angels. This narrative, in my opinion, is designed to lead us away from the true story of humanity on earth as created by God. That, that's just my personal belief. So was this whole Egyptian thing just another Smithsonian cover-up too? To divert us away from our truth? Or is all this, everything, every single thing I've said, is all of this just jumping to conclusions? Christians of various denominations sometimes ponder the idea that the Israelites may have actually come to North America long ago. And still others say that a group of Egyptians had also made the journey, and quite successfully, and that they may have even mined some of the plentiful copper in the Great Lakes region. Could it be that the giants are actually one or both of these groups that came over from Egypt and the Middle East? Maybe these tribes of Israel didn't come. Maybe not even Egyptians came. Maybe the Egyptians came. But is it possible that the giants did come? And they brought with them some of the characteristics from the land from which they came. Or were the giants always here? Or were they never here? The proof definitely seems to be everywhere. But as we've kind of already said... It is actively being destroyed and explained away. People who have found bones and skulls of giants and sent them in to be authenticated have had them completely disappear, vanish without a trace. Locations of interest such as mounds, burial sites, and other dig locations have been completely desecrated by these apparent professionals upon request for further analysis. These professionals will come in and just destroy the place, or they'll smuggle away whatever was found. Never to be explained. Never to be, uh, like, presented to the public in any way. Even beneath Oshkosh, Wisconsin, there are reports of an entire city with complete buildings. But they are beneath the roads, and archaeologists are quick to arrive at any sign at all that artifacts or buildings or ruins of any type are being pushed up to the surface or discovered, and nothing is ever shown to the people of what is dug up. But the archaeologists are okay with seemingly saying that, well, yeah, there's something down there, but... Don't worry about it. So again, why is the Smithsonian hiding all of this stuff? Why would they? If they are, I mean. We know they have no problem forcing a narrative that has at this point been irrefutably proven to be false. After all, they still teach Columbus got here first, for goodness sakes. No cross-ocean travel was even possible, they said, in those days. That there were no people before Clovis, even though we know that to be false. They teach that North American Indians never built pyramids, even though we can see that in the, in, in the United States. Repeated finds of armor, such as breastplates, are hidden away despite having been found a great many times all over North America. Like, there's two different types of armor that are being found. Some armor, we can't even explain where it came from. But we also know that Europeans were here prior to Columbus because we found their stuff. Copper culture of Great Lakes did not smell ores, they said, despite the fact that we know they did, and also that there was extensive trading going on of that ore. 
Cactus Hill, Virginia has evidence of human occupation long before Clovis. All of this is contrary to the narrative that they're forcing us to try to believe, I guess, because we don't really believe it anymore, but they just, and they don't even believe it. They know it's not true. So how far-fetched is it to say that maybe some of these dinosaur bones aren't dinosaur bones? These are giant bones. And maybe all of these giant bones that we have found and all these giant skulls and these giant weapons and these giant artifacts and these signs of Egyptians and other cultures that shouldn't have been here, that uh, seemingly were here, how is it far-fetched to say they're hiding that stuff too if they're willing to lie to our faces about this stuff that has been proven time and time again to be false? In my opinion, the answer for hiding the real story has to be because of paramount evil. There must be something they are hiding, such as the existence of a different timeline that leads to a reality of a divine creator, of God. They're constantly looking for this missing link and it's quite possible that giants actually negate the possibility for a missing link to even exist. Put that in your pipe and smoke it, Darwin. They may also prove that travel from other lands before Columbus most definitely occurred. They also prove that many, many, many religious texts across the world can be proven true. That's why giant bones are so dangerous. This is the last thing that a culture that wishes they came from nothing, for no reason, wants to believe. Despite the fact that Darwism, Darwinism is also a basket of water. But look, I know this has been a long episode, and I know it's kind of been all over the place, because there's, a, there's ten different rabbit holes you can go down over the course of the stuff that I wrote out here. Like, there's so many different avenues we could have gone down. And I did my best to kind of put it in a way that made sense, that tried to follow the Smithsonian specifically on dinosaurs and giants. Like, but that is so difficult to do because dinosaurs is a whole thing. The Smithsonian itself is a weird thing. And giants is also a whole thing. All of those things could be a whole series of episodes independently of each other. So... I hope you guys enjoyed this episode, and, you know, I've tried to make it as streamlined as possible. This episode is not, I'm not trying to force an agenda or a narrative either, because you guys could say, well, you guys are just forcing, you're just forcing this other narrative, and it's like, not really. I'm just here to try to open eyes and encourage digging. Google is filled with propaganda and lies, but very little actual conversation on these topics is actually being had. There are very, very many keyboard scientists and closet experts out here saying that none of this is even possible. But they appear to mainly just be licking the boot because they can go very little beyond their initial proclamation of falsity before they resort to just petty name calling and just words that make no sense whatsoever. They've thoroughly drank the water. And it appears to have gone down smoothly without any choking, which is honestly, I want to say it's a sign of the times, but for the narrative to be as ingrained as it is, it has been happening for quite some time. It is concrete in place. But people are waking up these days. Not everything is being accepted at face value anymore. Things are being questioned. And that is the point of this episode. Question it question the narrative when you look at your everyday life and it can go beyond giants it can go beyond dinosaurs and beyond the smithsonian when you find something that has been pounded into your brain for years and it starts to not feel right question it because it might not be right we are just humans and if we are really as pathetic as their narrative says we are why would we even begin to think like we have all of these answers if we're really that pathetic then why wouldn't we question the narrative that's just my way of thinking about it but listen guys this has been a long episode i hope you guys got something out of it Please remember to like, follow, share, subscribe. 
I really need you guys to go on the Spotify. Even if you don't listen to Spotify and rate me five stars, I've got some people who are attacking me on Spotify and dropping my rating. It makes me sad. So if you guys could go over there and help me out with that, it'd be fantastic. Um, I had a good time with you guys. I hope you guys get something out of this uh, this uh, this episode. I know it was wild and crazy, but you know what? Screw it. That's what we do here. Um, next time I see you guys, I might be in Wisconsin. So might be a different look around here. Not exactly sure, but um, I might do one more episode here. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. I'm living day by day right now. Everything is just so chaotic and, and crazy right now. But we're going to do our best. Um... Be safe out there, guys. Remember, don't drink the water and question everything. Later.